Welcome to Being and Becoming Podcast. My name is Logan Hauer. I'm joined today by my good friends and co-hosts, Austin Stone and Patrick Dyer. How you doing, fellas? Good day, good day. Doing well, absolutely. Right on, right on. Well, I'm, I'm very excited for the uh, conversations we're going to have today. And on that note, together, we are being, in, being honest in conversations about thoughts we're having and books we're reading in the hopes of becoming better, more able versions of our current selves. Today, we will be discussing Chapter 4, Compare Yourself to Who You Were Yesterday, Not to Who Someone Else Is Today, from 12 Rules for Life and Antidote for Chaos by Jordan Peterson. Let's get after it. So, uh, what he says on page 86 ties back into Chapter 1 when he's talking about hierarchies. Um, I think I made a note of this as well. I think I know where you're going. Okay. I have a bit of a critique here, and hopefully we can have a discussion on this. Um, so, he's talking about hierarchies, and he's talking about uh, people at the bottom. And here's the quote. People are unhappy at the bottom. They get sick there and remain unknown and unloved. They waste their lives there. They die there. Um, pretty bleak, Mr. Peterson. Um, here's my question. The bottom might always exist, but does that mean we should turn a blind eye? Is Do you think he's... Because I know he uses this for, like, something else, but that's my question. Uh, maybe you're saying to what, because I think the easy answer would be, obviously we shouldn't, but maybe the question is to what degree should we be concerned with the people at the bottom? Because obviously if you asked, I think anybody, they would say, oh yeah, it's, it sucks that someone is poor or in poor health or struggling or whatever but maybe is it a matter of what's our responsibility yeah or like what we should do about it maybe hmm. well what do you think Austin um yeah you nonchalantly answered my question there, bud. Yeah, that was good. <laughs> well, I do, I do say too, with my interest in economics, there's, you know, essentially, I guess you could say there are three systems of organizing economies. And I think one of the, maybe the old jokes or old truths is that there isn't a good system because mm -hmm. inevitably people always end up on the bottom of regardless of the system you choose. There's nothing really wrong with the bottom. Oh, it's... I thought, sorry, Pat, I didn't mean to. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I thought that something that was interesting, because uh, before that part about explaining the bottom having the poor health, the lack of options essentially, he says the winners don't take all, but they take most. Yeah. And I thought that that was very interesting as well. Almost more interesting than, cause you know, there's always going to be like, we were just maybe just talking about until I shouldn't say always until we feel like figure out a better, a way to arrange our economics or a better way to alleviate poverty or, you know, whatever you want to call it, there's, there's inevitably going to be people disadvantaged or people with a lack of resources. And is it the, you know, going back to your first question, Austin, what's the responsibility of the winner to be concerned with the person at the bottom or to, is there a moral obligation to, after you've won to help other people along get better or, you know, to help raise other people up and out. I don't know. Yes, there is a moral obligation. On what grounds? And it's very clear. And there's only one thing. Well, I'm sure there's many more. But one large thing is to enable freedom. Mm. That matters more than almost anything. Because if there's freedom any restriction. To do what? 
to choose. Choose the direction in which you want to go. So don't live it, anyone. I, yes, I think. I think. That would be a moral... Uh, what's what, what? What's the way you set it up, Logan? Obligation. obligation. Yeah, yeah, that would be a moral obligation of the rich, which would be to enable freedom. Could I go back to something you said earlier, Pat? Um, just for clarification. Of course. You said. You said there's nothing wrong with the bottom. Do you mean there's nothing wrong with the bottom existing, or there's nothing wrong with the people in the bottom? Like, like, it's not a value uh, judgment if you're poor. Both, but it refers more to, yeah, the people in the bottom. Because, I mean, the bottom is going to be relative to the system you're in, to the situation you're in. And it's not, I guess I have to be careful how I say this, it's not technically bad. It's just what it is. Same as the top, it's not technically good. Right. It's just it is what it is. It's Can not I a character add... evaluation. Yes. Can I it's... add a? Oh, sorry, I keep cutting in. No, no, that's good. What were we gonna say? Can I wasn't I... gonna say. Anything. I just wanted to add one detail, maybe to what you're saying, Pat. As far as, like, because I, I think having some under like uh, perspective, maybe is the word of where you're at, can also help. Uh, because you know, say you make. $35,000 a year in the US and you're you know upset about it because other people have more than you or you feel disadvantaged or you feel at the bottom or whatever but compared to the rest of the world you're in the top 1% of income right so yeah. even though in the US you're in maybe somewhere in the middle or toward maybe on the third quad you know quadrant or whatever as far as like what you're earning it's you know in the compared to the rest of the world it's you know you're doing considerably well so i don't because that's also a tough thing too and i think one of the things he highlights that stood out to me as far as something that was personally challenging in a good way was you know to it was something along the lines of I'll, like we tend to overvalue uh, what, or sorry, it's some, I think it was like you undervalue what you have and you overvalue what you don't have. Yeah. And so like, in that case, it's, I think he kind of gets into the way the mind works of, so let's say you're in this hypothetical, this person's making 35,000, they're not content with that. But then they look at the rest of the world, oh, I'm d actually doing pretty well, I know I can do better. And that's maybe more a healthier mindset instead of you know, taking on a, oh, I'm not doing well because other people are doing better. Instead, instead, you could maybe look around and say, you know what, other people are doing better, but I'm very fortunate to be where I'm at. And maybe this is something, maybe there are some things within my control that I can do to better myself, if that makes sense. Instead of feeling dismayed at, oh, there's, there's a billionaire. Like I, I'll never be a billionaire. And then you just kind, of, you feel defeated, or you're gonna stay where you're at. And you know, maybe that's, it's. I would want to extend it outside of just income, though, because that's a poor measurement of people's, like, how they're doing as like on one a, domain. Yeah. Right, it's only, yeah, thank you, Austin. It's only one measurement of how someone could be doing, but... Um, but a significant one. I'm not saying it's mm -hmm. unimportant, but it's definitely not the only indicator of well-being. That leads into something else Peterson was saying, which was self-criticism fueled by social comparison. So, like, in yeah. social media, uh, you only are comparing in one single domain. Wow. Um, so... Here's a good quote from Pastor Stephen Furtick. Think what you want about him, but he's good at one-liners. He said, "Don't compare, don't compare your behind the scenes to everyone else's highlight reel." That's a good way to say it, right there. Mm -hmm. 
Hmm. Unless you follow my Instagram where I'm just putting out just random. Or no, I post a lot of the, you know, me with the wife and all that. But, you know, other stuff, it's just like funny of me goofing off or not at my best or whatever. But I, hmm. I get the I get the point that you're making because that it is tough. Even like the way he explained how when you're younger or immature, when you're a kid, you don't have a good sense of self or value. And so it's easy to just look around and say, you know, this person's better at soccer than I am, like, you know, and have that be frustrating or or whatever. And when you're younger or immature, it's it's almost natural. And maybe you could even make the argue that it's good to a certain extent or it's beneficial to make those sort of comparisons because you you are trying to understand like who you are and how you relate with the world but then it may at least correct me if i'm wrong too at any point but it, it seemed like there comes a time based on the way he was explaining it where you would have a better sense of who you are and what you value and you know you don't want to be comparing yourself to joe schmo next to you because joe schmo's has a completely other set of things he's good at and that he's striving yeah. towards so um but yeah I, it's it's interesting to think because obviously when you're a kid you're not thinking about that of what are my values and like how am i i mean you are maybe subconsciously but i don't know how many kids are consciously thinking of like you know like i need a value structure and like whatever yeah. else but how about this quote your colleague, your colleague outperforms you at work. His wife, however, is having an affair, while your marriage is stable and happy. Who has it better? The celebrity you admire, you, the celebrity you admire is a chronic drunk driver and bigot. Is his life truly preferable to yours? I think that's piece of what you're saying, Logan. <laughs> wow. Multiple domains, right? Yeah, it's, huge danger of social media. Huge danger there. Well, Absolutely. When you're looking, yeah, when you're looking, when you're fixated at just the one thing, you can miss the others. And he actually, I think he talks about that as well as far as being narrow-sighted in your goals or your vision. He talks about how costly vision is, which I thought was great. As far as, like, physically, there's, like, so many, it's costly in the sense of, like, your actual biology. Like, it takes a lot of work for your eye to function and to see things but then even just taking it within this context of quote unquote what are you aiming for you know that whole that whole thing it's it's like yeah the vision like if you're not setting your sights or your aim at the at things that are worthwhile then what why do you expect to not be fulfilled or happy or at the quote unquote bottom of a hierarchy etc see now you're getting somewhere and that actually if i may yeah brings me into um also on page 86 it's in the section right above um something i highlighted was uh, where he talks about inside of us dwelling a critical internal voice um something we feel predisposed to it's difficult to quell yada 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 long story short he's asking if uh or what or no i'm gonna ask would you say this internal voice is universal in the fact that we're all made in the image of god and that relates to the higher calling because jordan peterson talks about that all the time you know aim higher or at least set an aim. When you get to that aim, set another. Try to keep elevating yourself. Right. Is this spirit driven? Well, of course, of course, we can set um, aims that are very high that aren't spirit led. But is just the fact that we want to pursue better or create better. The characteristic of being made in the image of God. That's a great question. Austin? <laughs> trying to find the point in the book where Peterson is like not completely condemning self 
the self critic in people's psychology. He's like, mm -hmm. it's kind of like a house inspector, like helps you figure out what's wrong with your house so you can figure out how to fix it. But that, but sometimes that self critic can take over. I think he, he even mentions when that critic gets too loud or too dominant, you need to let go of it and stop listening to it. Wow. Something along it, those lines. It, it may be around, if what I highlighted is what you're talking about, in 90 and 91. Dude, mm -hmm. I, had, I had 91. 91 hit me hard, personally. Yeah. It was 91. If you take a long time to read this chapter, if you really want to understand this chapter, it's going to take a solid couple weeks of, of right. reading because yeah. I have to reread paragraphs over and over and over to... I, Get I'm not it gonna all. lie. When I was going back through my notes for this chapter, I was essentially rereading it because, like you were saying, Pat, there's so much in it. Yeah. That even my first read through, I'm like, I missed this. I missed this and this and this and this. You know, it's like, did mm -hmm. I even read the thing? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, seriously. Was I there? But um, for the reader at home, for page 91 of this book, and I guess I can start first as far as like what stood out to me. And I'm sorry, I think we've gotten off of vision a little bit, but I think we can tie it this back in as good. well. Yeah, this works. This, this yeah. absolutely works. But on some of the things that stood out to me on 91, I'm a highly agreeable person. So this page really talks about, you know, how you shouldn't just keep your mouth closed all the time and try to endure that it's more worthwhile sometimes or in your best interest to actually speak up to yeah. create the conflict, to delve into the chaos, and then form an order about it. Oh and how, in fact, you know, I think this might be a later chapter, but it ties in here, how you might not even be loving yourself well if you aren't able to um, articulate yourself or if you're not willing to, uh, what's the word? It's not argue, but essentially you want to... Um, yeah, it's not argue, but you want to get your point across. You want to come, like, the person might not agree with you, but you want to at least come to an understanding of this is where I am. I'm willing to go this far. You want to negotiate well for yourself, basically, like, with other people. You don't want to be taken advantages, <coughs> advantage of in all of your doings, like, socially or otherwise. So, um, yeah, that's, I, I can see you guys both want to respond. So I want to hear, I want to hear some of your thoughts on all of that. I love how he said, consult your resentment. Mm -hmm. I wrote that, yeah. Okay, this is so powerful because God consults Cain's resentment. And, and God Cain consults his... refuses. Mm -hmm. So, what does it mean to consult your resentment? It means to question it, to reflect on it. And before Cain kills Abel... When Cain is like feeling resentful about the whole God favoring Abel more than Cain's offering, the Lord says, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? That's consenting resentment. Then God says, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at the door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Consult your resentment. You know, the whole idea of if you're not if you're not articulating yourself, if you're not standing up for yourself, defending yourself, what is your other alternative? You're going to become resentful at something or someone at some yeah. point. You know, if you, can't, if you can't identify or define your values and what you're willing to compromise and what you're willing to stand for, then if, if someone encroaches upon a value that you haven't adequately communicated, they might do so unknowingly, but you're you're going to feel resentment towards that person. And it, like you were saying, Austin, and it ties back into the Cain and Abel thing where, where there's this discord between you and your, your brother, your friend, your dad, whatever it is. But I also liked, I think it's also on this page. I can't remember, but he essentially talks about in that, oh, or no, this, this pertains actually back into the point about you know, setting little things that you can do every day to, to build trust with yourself, which is 
I, I'm sorry, I'm touching on a lot of different areas because there's so much in this. But this is good. This is good. All I good. Like yeah. I'm all good. Around a lot, but so you know, he essentially talks about how in order to build trust, your, trust with yourself, and obviously you have more reason than anyone to not trust yourself. But in order to build that trust, set things that you know you can do, that you know you could do, and that you would trust yourself to do without failing and it mm. could be something very small but then once you succeed at that thing reward yourself appropriately and don't move on to the next more harder thing until you've sufficiently rewarded yourself and anyway so i i explained that to tie it back into this of how you know one of those things that could be worthwhile based on this resentment piece and based on this value and trying to live out value in your life and according to doing these small incremental things that will build up trust within yourself to act upon value and where you're where are you setting your aim one of the things i loved was that he talked about try to what is it build or write or correct like a relationship with a father a friend a brother some you know one of those kind of relationships that might have gone astray for some reason but how that should be something you're considering your concerning your efforts towards you know mm. towards that damaged relationship where you're trying like that should be if that's something you value assuming it's something you value which hopefully it would be but it's it, you know you're trying to to set an aim that you, i want this to be better you know i want to forgive these people and then you're reaching out trying to mend these things and this resentment you know confront this resentment i mean and try to make peace with it and he was talking about the road uh the road to peace is filled with some wars or something along the way and um me being a very peace oriented person it's a good reminder that there are things you need to fight for and that are worth fighting for in order to love people better something this is going to be back to our previous point about the <clears throat> Uh, consulting the resentment of Cain, mm. God even consults his own resentment too, which we often forget or overlook. Yeah. Just wow. in the just what in creation, yeah. What do you mean? Before the flood, he's just straight up says, "I regret oh. creating you." Yeah, and that's resentment towards his own creation. We are truly right. I, Whoa. Yeah, and Crazy. and th so I was gonna say to tie back to my previous point, you know, all these things we call fallen which they fallen emotions which they have become that haven't been that and aren't supposed to be that so jealousy wow. resentment these are all attributes of being made in the image of god and so it, it's just really interesting to think and to acknowledge that this is not a weak thing to do it is not a low thing to do it's of the most high thing to do as a matter of fact if god had if god had to consult his own resentment and you think you don't have to whoa then then you're the lowest of the low i, I wish i had a better way to say you're that blind. but yeah there we go that's that's much better as yeah. a matter of fact jordan even yeah. says that shoot he even says Something about being blind. Uh, ones, we'll, no. we'll, we'll probably singer, get to it later. That, that's true, actually. That's very. That's a very good point. You're probably intentionally blind. So, it's, it's just a really interesting point to remember. Maybe it's easier to be blind than it is to confront your, the truth. Or to it is. That's, well, that's what he was saying. Yeah. Yeah. It's easier yeah that's what Jordan says later on. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and oh man, shoot. Here we go back to the beginning. I know. <laughs> sorry. Talking, I keep off crap. Too, man. No, it's good. It's good. So when we're talking about hierarchies and I was saying there's nothing wrong with the bottom, which is kind of like what we were saying, agreeing upon. And a trait of the people that occupy this bottom ring often is the ease of it. Now, it doesn't mean less stress or, or less or more peace. It doesn't mean less stress or more peace. It can, depending on where you are, 
or what system you're in, but sometimes it's paralyzed by suffering. Yes, and which is why I was saying um, freedom is necessary from the top. Ah. Um, but but that's a, a separate. But of course, but yes, laziness. yes, you're right. I, I should not deny there's laziness, you know. Of course. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, there's like la- where's the proverb like if you don't what is it if you don't go to work like you're gonna be sleeping in the weeds or something like this. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> something yeah. like that. Yeah. Like yeah. it talks about sluggards like. Hmm. Proverbs 6 is the sluggards chapter. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Shoot. I re- I've read it too much. <laughs> no, you've right. not, sir. Not too much. Okay. And I, so one thing that I think of, kind of maybe to bridge both of what you're saying, maybe it's part laziness, why someone would be at the bottom of the, you know, a hierarchy, and maybe some of it's suffering. But... I also wonder if is it a lack of values or I don't know could it yeah maybe purpose is a better word mm. or are the values what you use maybe it's not a lack of values but maybe it's are the values what you use to as the action to get yourself out of the situation should you be desiring to better yourself because like Pat was saying, like, there's always going to be someone that's content to to be where they are, and that's and that's fine too. But for someone that say is in a, a position where they're uncomfortable or they don't like being, they they want to strive for something better. You know, are these values the way that they would go about creating action in their life to? do something to get out of if we're talking income no i'm not right. talking income sorry okay well yeah. okay then this yes such a great question logan this is the problem with um health this is the problem with uh social welfare this is the problem with prisons it's you know it's all about the efficient cause it's let's get you feeling better it's and there's not like a purpose to it there's not like a meaning a value structure and this is this is the 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 positive influence that religion can have because it can give a structure it can give a purpose in ways that social services just can't they're not designed to do that interesting do you foresee a way to instill values because as an econ or I'm not an economist, what am I saying? As someone who's interested in economics, <laughs> I think they the economists would argue that values and systems are two separate things. But is there a way to <laughs> implement values or have values in one of those or more of those systems in order to better them? Or do there needs to be a humility. There needs to be a humility within the systems to point to what they can't do. So, if, how so? Like example. So, healthcare. Because I agree. They, but... they rehabilitate and they work to get you to keep living longer, but they don't teach you how to live. But they're not humble enough to say that's not enough to keep living. You need purpose. You need value. Here's some. Here's some things that are more helpful. There's less you know? money to be made. Oh yeah, it's monetized. With that, for which sure. is you can't monetize that's exactly purpose, value. You know, people do, yeah. and it becomes corrupt. Well, man, regarding healthcare and yeah, yeah, yeah. What are your thoughts? The lower, yeah, the lower you. rung. Well, like we've said in many episodes before, and I'm sure we'll say it many episodes to come. But when the rich get the cold, the poor die of the flu yeah. or pneumonia. That's because one healthcare is set up against the poor. Health insurance is insane. Yeah, like predatory uh, insane. <laughs> yes, okay. literally. Yeah, like even me, five hundred, five hundred a month. That's a quarter of my week. That's more than a quarter of my week. <laughs> like that's that's crazy. Imagine someone not making. I don't even make that much money. I make it right around that thirty-five that we were talking earlier times 12 
that's a solid chunk of money that what doesn't did, need to what did previous civilizations more primitive air quotes civilizations do about insurance our insurance has been capitalized and monetized in ways where in other communities it was more about the social fabric it was about oh if someone not doing well we're all going to pull together and help them you know i'm not explicitly trying to I'm not trying to say communism is best here, but I, I think we need to ask critical questions about, you know, what our society has come to and how it has monetized insurance. In this, We do need to ask critical questions. That's crucial in understanding the route to which we have, we're currently at, how we got there. We need to know the solid, concrete history of how, where we are today. Yeah. How regarding... Are things like yes. that instead yeah. of just looking at the failures i've always wondered too because the the part of insurance is saying all right i'm going to allow you to negotiate the price on my behalf you and the medical whatever you guys work out what it costs and i'll just pay a monthly fee whatever and then yeah. should i need these services you know i just have to pay a deductible or whatever and in principle, it seems like that should work fairly well, but you, it, it seems like they could provide a, a better service even, yeah. you know? And I don't know. I think there's a lot of room for improvement. I would, I for one, I, I'm with you guys where it's like, it'd be interesting to know the history because I definitely don't know it, but there's obvious, like very obvious r ways to improve or like, not ways yeah. to improve it, I should say, but there are obvious problems that need addressing with it. So, Well, one of the biggest problems is that we don't have much of a choice. There's hardly any freedom when it comes to insurance. That's a good point. And it's really true that insurance companies are the actual doctors anyway. Um, like, there's, there's so many, like, doctor parodies on <laughs> YouTube, which are hilarious, of, like, a doctor saying we need to get this procedure for a patient because of this and they're like okay let's go check with insurance and insurance won't cover it so then the patient has to pay like 50,000 for something and that's immediate poverty if you're <laughs> say given our previous examples on the lower end of the income uh, spectrum and or you have to take like out a, a loan to finance the yeah surgery or what have you yeah. And, and like that's just that's just crazy. That's just crazy. There's no freedom in in insurance. I think the idea of insurance is cool. The basic principle of it, where yeah, like yeah. if you pay the the monthly fee, something were to happen, you are covered. Right. But the monthly fee is crazy expensive. They hardly cover anything because the more they cover, the less money they make. Their whole goal is to make money. They're completely. It's completely government organized yeah and in private health uh we have a lot of people who use private um insurance at the hospital and they don't hardly cover anything like Medicare, and they pay Medicaid, all that sort it, of stuff. yeah it, well and like uh metashare too which oh, the, is one the of the christian one yeah it's one of the cheaper monthly rates but they don't cover hardly anything oh. because they don't have enough money one to cover anything and two well, okay, so that's not true. They would have enough to cover things, but that would leave less money for them, profit. Mm. And this is not an advocation for universal health care. That's basically what we already have, actually. Yeah, because but, the, are you saying the government already has such a hand in the requirements and in the... Yes, they're yeah. the only hand, as a matter of fact. So... That's what that's the issue, in my opinion. Yeah, but I wonder that it's such a tough thing to get through. Though. I, so everything that goes on behind the scenes is a mystery to me. I, I'm not going to lie. Like it's it could be like the Wizard of Oz to me where it's it basically is. It's, it looks yeah. like this immaculate thing. But then you pull the curtain back and it's just one guy with like a megaphone. Oh, my gosh. Like, that's how, this, that's how this works. Yeah, so. I well, the know, goal but... is for the rich to get richer. Uh, yeah. That's that's the thing. Do, don't you feel like insurance forgets about death 
Oh, don't forget, we're all gonna die. You can't ensure death. That's the actuary's yeah. job, yeah. <laughs> Figure yeah, out the, those calculations, mm. but... Mm. Yeah, I, uh... I have resentment for insurance. I actually... Solve that, dear sir. <laughs> I have this... I don't want to say the name of this idea, but I've been tossing around an idea with you guys as far okay. as things like... And it's been maybe a year since I've talked about it, but I've... There's... Uh, what you, So there's an idea I have that would take some an issue like this, let's say, with healthcare. And instead of, because obviously there's only so much we can even learn. Pat, I know you work in the field, but, mm -hmm. you know, there's only so much a person could know or understand about it. But if you had a movement, let's say, of having other people within that field, experts maybe even consulting, like this is how it works, these are the procedures, the processes, and then you have other people that are very good at taking a process and making it a lot better, more efficient, and you had all those people working together because, you know, it's the insurance company, sure, it's motivated by making a profit, but mm -hmm. it also, would benefit from serving people because right. think Definitely. about think about the the poor impoverished person they want that person as a client they don't want them to not be covered they want they want to be receiving yeah true that you know what i mean so it's they want those people to be insured they want everybody to be insured that so if you could arrange the incentives correctly or maybe even identify where the issues are you could get a better conversation about what might need to change and that, like I said, I know nothing about it, and it, it seems like an entire mystery to me how that stuff works, but the arrangements just seem wacky. Like you were saying, Pat, that someone could go in there, and the doctor's, the procedure he wants to do, it's his preference, but maybe something else works and it's covered, but since it's the way he wants to do it, it's $50,000 and whatever else. Like, I don't know. It just, it's so tough to saying, wrap my mind around. You're saying... Let's try to utilize greed for good. Let's try to incentivize, you know, a, a selfish desire to make money, you know, and try to bend it towards and keep them on the path of a good service, a good motives. Yeah, I mean, in general, not that this is the way you want to view everybody, but I think viewing people... Everyone's self-interested, actually. We can start there. Everyone has an interest to right. do well for themselves. As Some, you should. As you should. That's healthy. Some people are going to be shelf selfish, inevitably. So when you make a system that works, that functions on an idealistic, in quotes, like all things being equal, you know, sort of mentality, but then you yeah. have people trying to game systems or take yeah. advantage of incentives that's where you run into issues so and again there's not a way to do something perfectly but you want to essentially set up a system that incentivizes the correct behavior that limits the amount of chances that it can be manipulated or gamed and then ultimately help the people that it's intended to serve so and like i was saying i honestly i have no idea what it would look like in healthcare but it's interesting to talk about and to think about It is very interesting. I mean, I hardly know anything either, but. And going back, to, I think it was in chapter this. two, there is this idea where you look at the rest of, you can look at the rest of the world as greedy, vindictive, you know, etc. But then most of the people that you know aren't that way. And in fact, they're actually shouldering more than they can bear in the efforts wow. to help people. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I think mm -hmm. I like, there are definitely going to be people that try to game the system. And I think from an economic perspective, you should view others or not view others, but view the potential that there is going to be greed or that people will be greedy and try to use that against them or try to use that to help others. Those are the right questions to ask, man. Yeah. Very interesting. So transitioning kind of back into the chapter four discussion, 
I thought that the talk we were having related pretty well with the principle. I mean, so we are just talking about how you don't essentially want to have people gaming systems. But I do like the way Jordan talks about viewing success and failures of your day-to-day -day tasks or the day-to-day happenings as sort of little games obviously you're not trying to quote game them or game a system in that sense but right. how he's essentially setting up success and failure less of you know this is and this is in terms of figuring out what you're good at or what you value you know things like that he's kind of setting success and failure up as you know, you fail at one thing and you try another. It's not failure's not the end of the world. And honestly, too, there it's not that success is the best and failure is the worst. It's like there is a middle ground, actually, in in what you value and what you choose to act upon. And just to just to give an example that would be more helpful to make it more realistic is, you know, say we're all playing tennis. I'm awful at tennis. You know, I, I quote unquote fail at tennis and maybe I'm not the worst. Like maybe I don't all the way fail, but maybe I just don't enjoy it. Then mm -hmm. I'll move on and try something. I'll do ping pong instead. And maybe I like that a lot better, but I'm worse at it. And it, you know what I mean? It's like, mm -hmm. and so I keep doing that and then I eventually succeed or, you know, things like that. I thought that that was a really cool way of setting something up that happens often that I don't think about. With even, you guys know that uh, I love guitar, playing music, yeah. and I wasn't always good at that. Like, I failed a lot of the time when I, when I was first doing that, but I liked it, and I would get these little successes, and then I became decent at it, and then eventually, you know, I keep playing, and then I get proficient, and then eventually I'm good or good enough to where I feel like I'm succeeding yeah. at the thing. And I thought he also summed up well as far as the success, failure, continuum of value, how you're going to be good at some things, and you might be all right at others, you know, a select few of others. But then most of the, the things in life, you're either just not going to try or you're just going to fail at. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? It's like, and if you're winning at too many things, maybe you're not pushing yourself hard enough. Maybe you're too content. I love that idea of, you know, maybe you're doing too well. You're too content. You're not, you know, you're not challenging yourself enough. You're not bringing enough new things or things you could fail at uh, to try to balance out this, this sense of, you know, of working towards success or whatever that might look like. So curious to get some of your guys' thoughts on on that peterson is this is a part of the chapter where i'm like ah oh, this is so good because this is what a clinical psychologist is really good at really good at like let's ask let's consult yourself like ask yourself right. questions like like open it up and, and that's something um you know, I'm th grateful for my therapist that I've been to, and and he was like, ask yourself these questions, or or even he was like, ask your younger self these questions, and I'm like, is is that schizophrenia if I do that? He's like, no, no, like, <laughs> no, you're good. <laughs> it's good to ask yourself questions like that, and and how he was talking about like the self critic, like, talk to your self critic, like, what's helpful about your self critic and, and what's not helpful, and and what parts of your self critic do you need to let go of. Especially as it relates to, as you're saying, Logan, success and failure and how you might define it for yourself. Do you guys, are you guys at a point now where you're at that healthy balance, do you think, of I'm taking on enough, I'm, you know, do you have too much failure, enough failure, enough success, what does that even look like? I think I could answer honestly that I don't consciously think about that a ton, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dang, shoot, I do, but only in one or two realms, unfortunately. Video Where games you feel and like work. You're at... <laughs> the what? I said video games and work. 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> basically. <laughs> and more like the gym and work. Oh, yeah. But, yeah. Oh, nice. That that video quadrant. games take a back seat. Nice. Yeah. Well, mm, yeah. Shoot. Yeah, yeah. That's a good question. I don't think success and failure is the maxim that I live within. So right. what is true? What is same the structure, same. the maxim that we that we live within. Like, um, I mean, I always try to wake up and try to meditate. I try to pray. I try to, you know, get in the word and remind myself of my purpose and and really remind myself of the relationship that I think defines reality, which is my relationship with the Father, mm. Heavenly Father. You know, and and I would I want success and failure to be defined through my faithfulness in that relationship that's a very good measure which is filled with grace and makes it uh quite a bit yeah the whole my yoke is easy my burden is light kind of mm, reality mm-hmm. to it true mm. hmm. i i think my maxim might be something like passion what am i doing that's invoking something inside me that feels alive or feels worth doing and if i'm not feeling a lot i mean this isn't to say because even doing chores there's a sense of maybe it's maybe passion's not the right word but there's a sense of satisfaction or you know i'm doing something that helps my like me and my wife and it feels good or doing house pride like it doesn't always have to be like fun passion things but is what i'm doing life-giving and honoring to god and to other people and that's yeah i don't know and that is success then i guess for me but similar to yours austin i liked your use of the word passion that was good i did too actually i haven't heard that word in a long time you know what's crazy what's up every time or at least close to every time i hear the word passion or think of it i'm reminded of junior year of high school because that's when i was that's when I was really contemplating what passion is. Hmm. And, you know, <laughs> I, th- I always think of Mr. Bolser when I think of passion. Really? I, there's very few people, probably because he was one of the first ones I noticed it with when I started understanding passion. He was so passionate about loving students, I think. Maybe some more than others, and not intentionally, but he he's one of my favorite teachers just because of the impact he had on me due to his passion. All the time he would pull me aside to give advice or information or something or a rebuke yeah. or something, and it would always be done lovingly and in wisdom as if he were doing it passionately for God. And I always felt that it was a passionate connection he was trying to make in love because he uh, loves his situation. That's cool. And I remember I realized that real, real, real early in the year and just experienced it the whole time through. And then I just related it, tried to translate it into passion for basketball season because that was coming up. And so I wanted to play passionately and I wanted to when I had off days to passionately play with my friends and passionately enjoy time with my family and junior year would def I would definitely say that'd be the best year in terms of how I felt like happiness or something. I don't know a better way to say it, maybe joy or something because my goal and intent was to do all these things passionately. And then, Looking back, I would call that successful. I was successful in living life passionately mm. in that in those areas, so, which is real interesting to think about. Yeah, it is. But, Success and passion, and because you know, say you were successful at some of those things, but you weren't passionate about them. Is it? worthwhile uh, you know what I yeah mean? It, I don't know. It, you start you start edging yeah, yeah it might be a waste of time might yeah might could have you ever met someone who's good at something and they're like yeah but i don't like it 
Oh, absolutely. Yeah, like, I'm not passionate yeah. about it. And you're like, and maybe it's something that you're interested in, and you're like, oh, gosh, if only yeah. I had your talent. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, all too often. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or like well, what when is... students, or when teachers see students, and you're like, you're wasting your potential. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah. You could do so much better than this. <laughs> yeah. And they're That's... right, often. That's a isn't that Stephen King's kind of backstory where oh he wasn't I, I don't want to say he wasn't passionate about anything but definitely wasn't into school very much but would write you know liked writing stories and then he had a teacher that essentially said you're so much better than this like you can do you know that whole thing and then he ended up you know he stayed with the writing and started doing the books and all that but I honestly almost know nothing about him, and that's definitely third or fourth hand information. But <laughs> I feel like it might it might tie in there. Well, that's a question that I don't think the healthcare system asks. I don't yeah. think the uh, um, incarceration system asks. You know, it's mm-hmm. just kind of about punishment, less about rehabilitation. You know, mm-hmm. I don't think that's as much as like the schooling system should ask. They should be asking, "What are you passionate about? What?" For the healthcare system, why are you living, you know? Mm-hmm. I, I think it's sometimes too scary to ask that question, but I think it's healthy to ask that question. Isn't uh, some of the, I want to say it's one of the Asian countries, they don't charge you unless, what is it? There's some country, and again, this is probably third-hand information, but there's some country in Asia to where... They only charge you if they can make you better, if they can make you well. Austin, to your point of maybe the question should be, how do we, how are we making you well, or can we make you well, instead of can we fix this boo-boo or this problem, this ouchie. And this is what you were saying about incentivizing people to do good, right? So if you don't fix the problem, or if the patient isn't feeling better about their life, they don't owe you anything, you know, like, whoa, that's a huge incentive to make sure you're right. pleasing right. the patient. You're make sure, making sure that the patient feels fulfilled and, you know, maybe not but just health. It's, it's nice and it's a, assuming that this third hand information that I have is true. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice because it's reciprocal because not only are you as the doctor incentivized to okay i need to actually make this person better to the best of my capabilities so i know i can get paid or so whatever or just maybe you have a genuine interest in doing your job well and them getting better let's assume that as well but you know there's a there's a reciprocation because as the patient you know you could lie and say oh no the arm i don't want to pay the arm still hurts i'm just gonna oh yeah i'm gonna go back and ice it you know uh, it's still hurting but whatever it is, but you have to assume that there's this, this trust between the, the two parties that they want the same goal in mind and they're going to work together to achieve it. Like they both have to have that person's well-being in mind or whatever right. the goal is. They need to Not have, just their they both book. need, right. Well, and I'm just, yeah, that's true. Yeah. There needs to be cooperation. You know, there's, I just thought of something, uh, back to the passion thing. It's much easier to deal or confront or whatever your suffering when it's, when you're, when the suffering is within the aim for your passion. Ooh, yeah. Voluntarily taking it on. Babe. Yeah. Ex- yeah. Sure. Yeah. That's true. True. That's, that's how he right says in. it. Yeah. 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 That's what I was going to, I was going to mention. Peterson's quote, and I want to hear you talk more, Pat. What you aim at determines what you see. And he says, I wrote it on 96, you aim at what you value. Yes. So if you're not Hmm. aiming, you could become a nihilist. (laughs) Yeah, to go back to that discussion from the last podcast, I think that but yeah, if you don't even care to aim, you know, why does or it if matter? You think aim so. is worthless. Yeah. 
like I'm just I'm trying to I'm trying to take all this in and apply it to tomorrow at work. I'm not looking forward to it. Mm. Basically at all. It's a Saturday. It's literally literally the entire day. It's over. I wake up an hour beforehand and don't get home till about 30 minutes to 40 minutes, sometimes an hour after. So it's all in all about 14 hours. I'm only getting paid for 11 and a half because I don't get a lunch or because because I get a lunch, but that's the only break. And it's just like, I'm not. Can I put you on the spot here? Please. Question. What are you aiming to do tomorrow other than just finish work? Is there anything that you can mm. aim at while you're at work? Y- yes. And I every day remind myself to to aim to love these people to the best of my ability. And that's super hard and okay. takes a ton of energy. Because literally saying the best, I've only ever actually maintained my best for maybe like a day or two at a time max. Because if you actually give your best, you use so much energy. And me giving my best is actually ruining my lower left leg, unfortunately. Good I have gracious. these... Yeah, yeah, it's it's not good because I'm not. If I were to work my best and my hardest to provide for the patients that I'm supposed to care for, I mean, there's so just so much stuff to do, and I'm on my feet 24 seven, so I'm getting these really bad varicose veins. Oh. But but anyway, so I have to reevaluate my best. But but yeah, that that's what I'm aiming for is so- to do. When you talk about loving people, who are you talking about? Are you talking about your coworkers or your patients? Both, for sure. And how would you define loving each of those categories? Both, definitely listening. Yeah, listening much more than I speak. Trying to put myself, especially in the patient's shoes, uh, because I've been in excruciating pain before, and oftentimes they are in excruciating pain. And so I'll try to relieve as much of it as possible within the realm that I can. Yeah. And side side note, something that just makes me so mad. There are so many nurses that I work with, but just in general, that will withhold pain medication to a suffering patient because they think they're faking. Anyway. Oh, wow. Do you, it's do you disgusting. Think it's common that people fake it? I th- and no, I don't think it's common. Why, I, why do you think well, like they're faking it then? Oh, because the addiction or is that? Be, yeah, so it probably, yeah. Uh, oh, man, well, here's a tangent. Shoot. <laughs> Crap. <laughs> There's just so many times where nurses, what, people love to have power over another. Oh, and nurses true. have have the thumb. The patient is under the nurse's thumb in so many situations. And we just have a ton of nurses that will withhold pain relieving substances to patients just on the fact that they think they're faking. That's evil. So even if the nurse has this small inclination that maybe their patient is faking, they go with it because that's a way to, uh, to enact power over them. Yes. Oh, literally. I'm just going to make this decision for them because I can, you know, maybe, maybe. Yeah. They think they know better. I think that's exactly right. I I have a question as well, Pat, for the uh, uh, nurse-patient relation. You were saying that they're under the nurse's thumb. Is that unbeknownst to the patient? Or do do they have an idea that the nurse is doing, you know, what you're, what you say? Yeah, how contemptuous are they? (laughs) Right, thank you, Austin, yeah. I, the, if you're a first time or second time patient, you probably wouldn't know. If you're an experienced oh, hospital wow. patient, you would probably catch on pretty quick. Uh, but and you yeah. wonder why people don't like hospitals. Yeah, or nurses. I don't blame them at all. Wow. If you have a bad experience with a contemptuous nurse, that'll do it. Yeah, because I mean it's, and that could, we can always tie that back into the power thing the hierarchy thing okay but but anyway back to (laughs) so my aim i guess i need to define my aim not for tomorrow but for the extended future better so that way i can justify the very minor suffering 
to get there. Emphasis yeah, on yeah. the minor because it's not exactly. it's not like tomorrow's torturous. It's just something I don't want to do. Mostly because of the length of the shift. If it were an eight hour shift, I actually probably wouldn't complain at all. Okay. But because then I would still have an evening, which is what I'm used to. It's grueling. But yeah. Yeah. So how can we frame our daily routine as an adventure to voluntarily take on to journey instead of wow. your daily routine happening to you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Patrick, Patrick's like, okay, I'm going to walk into work, even though I'm not fancy about this 14 hours, I'm going to walk yeah. into work and look for ways to listen to people today. Yeah. You know, that's an adventure because what, you don't know what people are going to say. That's why you're listening. You know, that's a bit of an adventure there. The patient, True. the coworker, you know, and just try to try to suck as much life as you can out of that man, because I can I can just feel your legs getting tired after ten hours, you know, like yeah. And I'll do that. I think I'll do exactly that. That'll probably yeah. be my mindset when I wake up. Try to make an adventure by just listening. You can get very far with that. Yeah, and that's a great let, point. Thanks for letting us put you on the spot there, Patrick. I um, always I love how you're focused about practical application you know mm -hmm. i i appreciate i need people like you in my life my wife is one of those yeah. people who will be like come on down from up there austin stop intellectualizing <laughs> everything how are we gonna apply this how are we gonna love how are we gonna live it's mm -hmm. beautiful we need that question thanks for letting us uh pick on you there a bit always feel free anytime i love it yeah and i think austin too yeah for the listener you know, at home, that's a good question. And even for myself too, I, I was thinking as you guys were talking, what does that look like for me and my routine? How do yeah. I make my routine come alive or be more passionate or um, purposeful maybe is a good word too of, you know, I think too, we've talked a lot off air, the three of us, how, you know, I work remotely. I don't interact with many people uh, for my job and then just has been kind of a lonely phase of life right now and I like that challenge that you you know kind of phrased to Pat as far as like the pe you know even in my situation it's not a physical pain it's isolation which is a you know a different kind of pain but I can still reach out to people I still have things that I can do within my control to make my day more worthwhile <clears throat> sorry more worthwhile and not only that i can hope hopefully try to like pat was talking about try to understand the way other people feel better and um his was with the physical pain but mine could be maybe like an emotional mental thing and um try to better understand others i'll have to think really hard truthfully about how to go from everything we've talked about into applying it to it's not easy man the next few days you know yeah because i mean there's there's a lot of things i don't want to do and i'm not talking about going to work but i mean like taking in everything we've spoken about and will continue to speak about through however much longer we have and then not wasting it because i don't want to i don't want to learn or relearn things and then not apply it because then that's me considering it not good enough for me, which is not true. So I want to utilize what what we say and learn and think and do and apply it for a better life, for a higher reaching life, aiming more for heaven. And that's hard. It really takes a lot of effort. That's very much in the line with First Corinthians 13. You know, if I had all the knowledge in the world but have not love... Mm, nothing if go. i sacrifice my body you know to be a martyr but didn't have love nothing if i could speak True. in the tongues of angels but didn't have love it's nothing so that's beautiful patrick that <laughs> that's a fantastic point in. that was a fantastic point mm, i'm glad you said that mm. yeah that's true all, all in all no matter what just love the person love your neighbor when all when when you can't think of anything else, just love your neighbor. Mm. Dang.
Thank you for tuning in to this week's book club discussion. Please let us know if you have any suggestions as to books we should read or topics we should discuss by contacting us at beingbecomingpodcast at gmail.com. Again, that's beingbecomingpodcast at gmail.com. We hope you join us next week for another conversation.